and it's a pleasure to be connected with uh, uh, with a KFUPM student, um, Shargawi as well. So we are based in the MAM and uh, that's that's a special moment to connect with uh, such a pool of talent to talk about uh, Sari. But let me give you a bit uh, background about Muhammad before starting Sari. Uh, as Taha mentioned, spent some time actually in Canada around eight years. Did my undergrad grad there. Work a little bit in the wealth management industry with the Royal Bank of Canada, and mainly ultra high individual uh, uh, profiles. Then uh, went to startups and uh, startup before actually my MBA, that startup uh, failed. It was mainly focused on education and capture a lot of learnings on that, on that journey. Then during my MBA, I had actually the, uh, let's say, there was an entrepreneurship track to start your own startup. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, same actually uh, syllabus available in KFUPM, but we were able to, to, to formulate our startup pitch, go to multiple gates, and if that project would succeed, you might actually receive funding, what's similar, I think, in the Dahran Valley. Um, and in that time, I, I launched uh, a grocery uh, marketplace in Canada focused on a um, halal market and that actually became successful and I exited that market to one of the large diary company in, in North, Amer North America. Came back to 2016 in, in to, to the region, worked with Kareem. I actually was the market launcher and uh, launched 20 cities in KSA. I launched Bahrain and Kuwait and learned there the biggest uh, challenges with you deal with legislator of new innovation, uh, disruptive technologies, how to start a new market. And it's been a, an awesome experience because you've done it with the hyper growth business and you do not actually use your uh, capital yourself. So learnings with someone else the capital understand the dynamics uh, after that uh, when kareem got acquired by uber i moved actually to cirque cirque a german company was micro mobility it's about scooter electric uh, electric bike and we're focusing in university like kfupm and the mina and uh, we launched actually in abu dhabi in dubai and riyadh then it got acquired by Bird. Bird is the largest micromobility company in the world. Um, so that's my journey before going to Sari. And Sari uh, idea came from problem that I was facing and wanted to solve for a long time. During my time as Kareem, I was the GM uh, for logistics. And as a GM for logistics in Kareem, you oversee uh, three profile. One is the food industry, which is Kareem now, that competitor to Hunger Station, Uber Eats, and others. Second is Kareem Box, which is the logistic arm for all the e-commerce company, Amazon, Noon, and others. And the third is the C2C, or the peer-to-peer, -peer, which is like Mersul, and it's available in the app. So I've seen all the spectrum of the logistic, from peer-to-peer -to, -peer to B2B, and I've seen a huge fraction between uh, B2B uh, players, especially on the first mile uh, challenges. So a lot of restaurants, a lot of uh, mom and pop shop, either bakala or supermarket or whatever. Apply due to, to a lot of challenges when they go to the wholesale market. So a lot of small businesses cannot reach the factory or the producer. And our focus was in Sari, how to bridge the gap, how to make sure that the product moves from the factory immediately to the shelf. So we cut all the middlemen. So you as a business owner can have uh, control over your gross margin. You have control on the profitability and you no longer need to hire a purchasing team as you grow. 
but that's been the mission to empower businesses to 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 prosper and as we go we are moving just from procurement to financing as well so we are financing a lot of small businesses to have more cash flow in terms of purchases and that's going to help a lot of SMEs on the coming five to ten years for, for that Sari uh, today Sari is 40 uh, employees uh, we operate in three cities the Mam, uh, Jeddah and Riyadh and our focus to cover KSA and probably expand globally we've been successful to close multiple financial rounds which is part of the journey of a, of a, of a startup but this is a bit about Muhammad, uh, a bit about uh, Sari and the learnings. Uh, happy to, to answer any question that uh, comes from you, Taha, or the, or the... Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Uh, okay, students, so today we'd like to make it a bit more uh, dynamic and uh, the discussion we want it to be open. So I think uh, our groups have already been uh, thinking about what they're doing basically. This whole summer training uh, that they're currently doing is all about uh, creating uh, a startup at the end of the uh, course. So basically it's a two month course and uh, they're supposed to come up with a business idea and a business plan and then hopefully uh, they'll be able to, in the next coming semesters, they'll be able to do a startup. Now the whole uh, purpose of, uh, so we have different different sections and my section is basically focusing on the COVID-19 situation currently. And uh, before we go into that, uh, would you like to enlighten us on how, what are the challenges that Sari is facing and what are the opportunities that you are actually having uh, uh, with this uh, current situation in place? Okay, definitely. So let me start first with uh, how, do, how did you start your uh, venture? Uh, it has to be there must be a problem that you want to solve and that problem has to be huge it has it has it has to be in a big market that you can scale to you can build uh, a large startup so that's been uh, the beginning for sari uh, one of our focus is not to build something that already a red ocean a lot of people are actually competing on we wanted to avoid actually competing uh, with uh, governmental entities that are doing infrastructure work. So we try to fill the gaps and that's our uh, focus. When it comes to COVID-19, I think uh, COVID-19 is a curse and blessing at the same time. Um, a lot of e-commerce actually adaptation has been uh, accelerated. In the U.S., uh, the last eight weeks, the adaptation from uh, offline retail to e-commerce grew from 16% to 28%. And that was projected to be done in 10 years. So e-commerce penetration and adaptation was to the roof. This is one uh, positive thing uh, in the Sari direction. Second is... Uh, the region is to be known as a cash industry and cash is king here, but due to COVID-19 and, 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 uh, and kind of interaction with the money, online payment has grown actually in the, e and the, in the B2C section to be almost 70%. B2B grow almost to 50%. So, so even ease of collection and payment has uh, adjusted aggressively. When you go to volume, in March alone, we did what we did in 2019, almost 50% of what we did in 2019. So there was a huge surge of demand. Uh, due to curfew, a lot of the middlemen actually are not certified to operate on these hours. And we're here, Sari, fill the gaps and continue to create sustainable solution for small businesses and distributors. So in the moments of, let's say, uh, crisis, there are a lot of opportunities. That happened in 2008, 2010 with Airbnb and Uber. And I think it's the same uh, era is happening now and a lot of startups gonna be born in that, uh, in that times. 
Wonderful. Uh, what kind of opportunities do you think that students should embark on nowadays, especially with this situation and looking at the post-COVID uh, uh, economy that we're looking at with, like you said, a lot of focus on e-commerce, a lot of focus on startups. Do you have any specific area that uh, students, do you think that they should be focusing on from now on and they should be building up uh, uh, on that? Definitely. So. I think a lot of a lot of uh, objectives in the in the vision 2030 need to be taken uh, with a lot of analysis. One of them is the logistic index. So Saudi Arabia today at 92 uh, ranked globally, and the focus is to push it actually to 25. So there is a huge opportunity in the logistic. And when I say logistic, I don't talk about RMX or these players that do cross-border, but logistic on the, on the local emphasis and the urban uh, context. There are a lot of players in the last mile delivery, so that's a bit crowded. But there are huge areas in micro-fulfillment and warehouses, management, on-demand uh, collection. There is a huge space on the area of last yard rather than the last mile, since we don't have actually postal code that cover everyone. So last yard uh, fulfillment is a huge market. Uh, also fintech, fintech is booming on the region uh, and globally as well. Uh, and it's gonna be very, very critical uh, post COVID-19. One of the mandate actually from the government is to to increase the banking loan uh, percentage from two percent to five percent to smes so a lot of actually microfinancing a lot of uh, invoice financing gonna happen and a lot of if you can hear a sandbox in sima those all created to to, to push smes contribution give them better cash flow and we assume there will be a huge uh, financial and economical stimulus to make sure that SMEs does not close up, does not collapse on that period. So fintech is going to play a huge role, especially lending and microfinancing. So there, there are a lot of opportunities over there. And of course, employment uh, is evolving. Uh, a lot of layoffs happening in the industry. A lot of industry needs to be Saudized. One of them is actually Bakala. Uh, we've seen actually yesterday uh, commercial concealment program which is, uh, with, with the Ministry of Commerce and Investment launched a campaign with Munshaat, with, uh, with Baladia, m uh, 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 promoting that you, sh you could start your actually uh, retail market or retail mini market just to fight commercial concealment. And just to give you an understanding of commercial concealment, last year around 400 billion real was in the commercial concealment, meaning the government was not able to trace the money, was not able to put uh, any taxation on it. And that's almost 20% of the country GDP. It's not to be recognized. So there are a lot of huge space to be digitized on the, on the offline market. And I think there are a lot of opportunities for uh, for the for people in that in that class to come with. Thank you. Uh, let's take some uh, steps back and retrace your steps with Sari itself. Now, uh, the first we always ask students, and and students always ask us, uh, what are the main challenges that an entrepreneur faces when starting up? So maybe can you share some insights on? What are the struggles that you did in the first couple of months when you were actually starting Sari? And uh, how did you overcome these obstacles? So I think one of the biggest question is, are you solving a real problem or not? And a lot of people get this wrong and solve their problem rather than the market problem. And I think about 50% of businesses failed because their product has no market. And uh, I think the biggest uh, lesson I learned that you need to move fast, you need to learn, you need to iterate. It. So if you are trying to launch a business to solve a problem, 
you need to start with a basic form. And that gives you the capability to learn, to adjust, to iterate. Uh, I've learned from my mistake before spending a year and a half or two years building the perfect product. And then when you go to the market, the market tell you a totally different story. And I've learned that with Sari, where I launched an MVP with a couple of weeks, capture learnings, continue iteration until we had the product market fit. So product market fit is a critical uh, before you grow, before you scale. Otherwise, you're going to grow on the wrong market. So you need to make sure that you're starting very lean, very agile so you can adjust. Do not spend a lot of money in the uh, early days because there are high chance you are pivoting. And you need to make sure that you are uh, moving very fast uh, and capturing the learning that uh, you're looking for. So I think um, you just need to have the MVP mentality. Don't be attached to your ideas because a lot of them is going to be challenged by the market. And don't build product for yourself, build it for the market. And I, I like one of the quotes by Reid Hoffman. Reid Hoffman is LinkedIn founders and in PayPal said, if you're not ashamed from your first product, you're too late. So that's my biggest learning. Wonderful. Uh, now you're talking about uh, skills and you're talking about money involved. Uh, first, let's focus on the skills. What are the skill sets do you think that, and the mindset do you think that uh, students should start adapting from now? Like for example, right now they have around one year left to go in their studies. What can they do right now uh, to de develop themselves for them to be ready to take on the market, as you say? So I think uh, the first uh, stepping stone to, 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 to build your business, I think you need to try. I think you need to, to capture enough learning. So don't need to be hesitant. You have to continue learning. I did two startups. I failed and once I exited uh, and the second. I did so much volunteering. I worked with two startups before. So that accumulated experience gonna give you the uh, more equipped uh, know-how to tackle problem. So I think you should start today uh, either working with a startup or starting experimenting with uh, your idea never delay uh, any launch that will give you enough learning uh, in how to to maneuver how to to understand the market the, the the preference for me is to go with a startup i did it with kareem you could do it with other startup including sari just to capture the learnings and from there you can formulate the opportunity your idea and you can launch it uh, where you have enough understanding of, of the pace of a startup. Because when you talk about startup, Sari, for example, quarter 2020 grow 650x from quarter 2019. So you need to understand the magnitude of a scale. Uh, and that's need to build a lot of experiences, how to build the scale very fast, how to, to build the lean uh, operations. So I think. You need to get your, your all up your sleeve. Do not stuck in the theory. Just go try, uh, work with the startups or start your own things and capture learning as fast as you can. Another uh, main important uh, point is that if you are a technical uh, co-founders, either a software engineer or a computer science or industrial, Look for a partner, look for a business partner that complement you. Look for the delta in terms of skills so you can have balanced uh, co-founders. Uh, I would love to see a lot of businesses happening with one founders, but that's very rare because you need someone to lead, someone to go fundraise. So the roles and responsibility is very uh, widespread. And if you are only one person, you're going to be spread thin. So you need to have someone complement you as a partner. I've seen a lot of actually experiences where people go and build their technology outsource uh, either in India or in Egypt or probably in Europe. The biggest problem is if you don't have technical partner owning the infrastructure, 
you always move slow. Uh, your intellectual property is not uh, robust, cannot be developed going forward. So having a partner equally strong as you is very critical. Last point is try to focus on building uh, the organization after your product succeed. They say culture eats uh, strategy at breakfast. Uh, you need to build the right team. You need to, to incentivize them. Don't get attached to your equity because if you have 90% of a business that's worth 1 million, is nothing compared to having 50% to a business valued at a 1 billion, which is a unicorn. So try to build a culture, try to incentivize everyone try to create a sense of ownership within the business as you grow. I think these are very good insights uh, for the students to take. Uh, talking about the investments and uh, talking about people, and we know that people invest in people at the end of the day. Uh, mashallah, you also have, uh, as Sari, they have recently received the Series A funding of 6.6 .6 million. Uh, can you tell, how you received the first seed funding and what were the obstacles and how did you know you guys are ready for the series a so the steps in terms of the investment uh, term sheets etc uh, etc et yeah so the, the 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 ideas start to more from an idea to a project to a product then to a company then to an organization so first an idea start morphing to a project, then start moving to a product. Product, then you have to see a good traction. Uh, you start to see a good sign of uh, product market fit, meaning your retention at a healthy stage, your, uh, your cost of acquisition, which is CAC, is, uh, is under control. Uh, you're seeing good engagement with your, uh, with your technology, with your product that you're offering. So, there are very critical KPI you have to look. There is something called matrix funnel. You need to look at the CAC, you need to look at the LTV, which is lifetime value for the customer. That, as soon as you see a good sign, then you have to go start uh, fundraising. One of the things that helped us a lot is that when we started the business, immediately we went through an acceleration with STC, uh, program called Inspire You. So we went through uh, a boot camp of, 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 uh, of an acceleration. And I think that uh, in your degree, you're getting as well that acceleration to understand the entrepreneurial landscape. So we went through intensive six month program to weed out all the, 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 the things that we want to get read in the business model and the, in the, our projection on where we're going the next five to, to, to six years. Then we start fundraising and fundraising on the first three, four rounds is gonna be about the team. So that's what I say. If you're gonna build a startup, you at least have an expertise on it. So teams is very critical. Then how big is the market? And the most important question that a lot of people miss is why now? Why you need to start your business now? Uh, Twitter started actually in 2004, it didn't succeed, then they relaunched again, uh, and I think in the late 2000, and it succeeded. So timing is very critical to starting your business. So you need to answer three questions. Who is leading that business? How big is the market? Is it multi-billion market? And why is it now? And in the first, as I said, three or four rounds, it's about storytelling. How are you gonna uh, build that business to be a company? How that company in five, six years is gonna be independent from you as a founder? And a lot of people think that startup is just uh, a sole organization that you're gonna own forever. No, you need to have a mentality of building something successful, something has legacy, and something has a path from entry to exit. And there is a clear uh, independency where the business in five, six years has the board management. And, uh, and that's give you responsibility to hire the right team, the right people that challenge you, that built 
the legacy with you in this journey. But yeah, the biggest challenge for a lot of startups, let's say in the region or in Saudi specifically, is that the legal structure. You need to make sure that you nail the legal structure from day one. Uh, you need to have to make sure that you have the right registration. You have to make sure that you have the right bookkeeping. You need to make sure that you're complying with all the registration. Because we don't have neutral territory inside your free zone, you will be forced to, to register uh, in, in either uh, Cayman Island or PVI or British Virgin Island or what we did in, in Abu Dhabi global market. Why these free zones are important, it will give you and your investor natural zone for, uh, for attribution and uh, court uh, uh, challenges. So a lot of investor international gonna come invest in you. In Saudi, we have actually a Chinese investor with $1.5 billion asset. We have a local investor, uh, so international investors are going to come to the region and they are now uh, seeing the huge opportunity here. But you need to have the legal structure for them to be entering and investing. Otherwise, it will be a barrier for them. So this is something you need to take note and understanding. I need to build the right legal structure and have a holding company that... Uh, on all the stakes and intellectual property going forward. Then the second part is the commercial. The biggest, uh, uh, let's say, remedy for investment is growth. If you are growing at a healthier pace, all the investor will be talking to you. And here where you have the opportunity to tell the story. And you need to know why are you fundraising? Do you have actually uh, a clear projection? And uh, one of the things that I learned in my early startup, I come and I put the perfect scenario. I'm going to build a $10 billion company in three years. I'm going to have 60% uh, market share, but that's not the reality. You need to do a best case scenario, base case scenario, worst case scenario. And all these scenario needs to have something called hypothesis. So you need to have hypothesis. There are no facts. And these hypotheses need to be challenged by investor, by your colleagues, by everyone until these hypotheses get polished. And I see a lot of people tend to overpromise, and that's not the reality of startups. You need to be realistic. You need to go actually for the worst case scenario and try to, to over deliver. And so be realistic. Uh, and try to build a realistic market share and a projection uh, going forward and try to always adjust uh, so to have the right compass and direction. Thank you. We'll take some questions from students. I think Ahmed Batuk, you have your hand raised up for quite some time. You can unmute. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes, doctor, I have a question. Uh, so let's say... Uh, in a startup, uh, uh, Mr. Muhammad Dasri said that uh, one of the most important uh, things is to have a great team. So, uh, if I'm going to maintain this uh, team um, at a startup, maybe it will come at a cost. So, uh, how can I, uh, let's say, minimize the effect of this cost? Yes, so early on, uh, you might not have actually the budget to hire everyone. So you need to first prove uh, the worth of your, let's say, project. Is there actually uh, a market? Is there actually a project you're working on? You need to have a clarity on how big is the market. And then you have your own founders. And of course, I, I started Sari, I had uh, saving myself uh, I, I, I have the ability to do bootstrapping so you cannot jump on tomorrow and start a business and you don't have uh, the capacity to at least bootstrap for six and nine months before fundraising so you need to have the bootstrapping uh, mentality you need to hire the essential employee uh, 
uh, you need to actually give them something called ESOP, uh, employee stock option, uh, so they can feel on, uh, the ownership. And a lot of people, even your close friends, are not going to believe in your idea, and that's fine. You need to continue, uh, let's say, proving them wrong and continue developing the, the business and work with the minimum cost that you can uh, bear. But uh, accelerators, as I mentioned, inspire you, give you actually a working capital of 100,000 real. Wa'ad, actually in Aramco, your neighborhood, give you the same amount, which is 100,000. They give you an office. So these accelerator minimize the cost so you can have money to invest on working capital. So try to look for those source of money that are free and does not dilute an equity from your cap table. So that's help you at least for the six, nine months until you secure a fund. If you are a serial entrepreneur that you did it before or you have a success, I think there are a lot of investors willing to come to the at pre-revenue. So you need to raise a small amount, uh, build a good traction, then continue raising the next round. But you need to share a lot of equities early on. And the available instrument is ESOP. Wonderful. Uh, Ahmed Al Khalifa, you have a question? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed Dossier, for being with us. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, beside the, my idea, for, for example, if I have a, an idea and uh, I want to make a startup, Beside the idea of the, of the startup, is there any uh, factor that I can convince the investor to accept my idea? Even, let's say, my, my idea is simple. So, and it will not make like a, a much money. So, how can I convince the investor to accept my idea? Uh, that's, that's it. So they say ideas are worth a dime. So everyone can have an idea. Investor actually can give you ideas if you want ideas. It's all about the execution. It's all about the return on investment. If an investor does not see a turnover of his money to 10x early on, he's not going to give you money. So you need to show traction that if your business value today is 5 million, it's going to be in a year 50 million. So there must be a money on that game uh, and you have to show them a huge market. So if you come and say, I'm going to build a business delivering sushi in Saudi Arabia, it's going to ask you how big is the sushi market in Saudi? Is it 10 million, 50 million? This is nothing. It has to be at least multi-billion dollar market. So you, can, you could have enough market share of it. So in two, five years, at least you have 50%, which is $2 billion business. But if your end game is going to be a couple million, that's not attractive for investor. It could be good for uh, bank loans that we can build the business. And I think there are a lot of uh, funding opportunity, even in the government entity. But when you go to venture capital, which is VC, they expect at least five to 10 X's on their investment. And that's cycle used to be from one year to two years. So if your business is not gonna grow to 10 X next year, probably you're not attractive for the venture capital space. Uh, but mo uh, most, most of the, uh, like the, the entrepreneurship said that, uh, no one will, will make like a 10 or 20 million dollars within a year like you have to to even to create a, a unique idea to get this uh, uh, much of money in one year one year it, it's time to just break even your costs or other costs that have been uh, coming with your idea so how in, in one year, I, I, I make 10 to 50 to 100 million uh, dollar or real Saudi in a, in a year. Yeah, so there is one year where you develop the, let's say, if you spend one year developing the product, that's a long time. You need to at least spend, as I said, 
two months building an MVP a prototype to start getting the right information. Wallahi, you have 100 customer. That's a good sign. Now you can go talk to the investor. Say, I want to grow from 100 customer to 1,000 customer or 100 customer to 10,000 customer. I need the amount to acquire those customers. I need to hire the people. And I believe in a year from now, rather than making uh, 10,000 real monthly, I want to make 100,000 real uh, revenue or GMV, if we call it gross merchandise value as a sales monthly. And I want that money to generate. But if today you come to them, I run my business, or I launch my business today, my revenue is 10,000. After one year, when you give me the money, it's gonna be 12,000. That's not enough growth for them, especially at early stage. Uh, VC, again, looking for a start of that grow annually from four to five X minimum. So if you are today generating a revenue, you need to go ask for a money that help you to grow 10 X by the end of the year. And it's going to be looking difficult, but, uh, we have seen that traction from couple thousand to, to couple hundred thousand. And now we are doing a couple of hundred million dollars. So you need to continue presenting your projection realistically and with the, with a focus to grow that, uh, revenue to 10 X. But if your market's small, you will not be able to generate that value, neither to your business nor to your investor. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, students, uh, we're still open for questions, so please go ahead, raise your hands, unmute your mic, and then you can ask the questions. Uh, talking about, uh, while we're waiting for students to ask the questions, talking about customers right now, how, what, who was your most, uh, or I wouldn't say who, but how difficult was it to get your first customer, uh, Mohammed, if you'd like to share? And how did you actually go about doing that in the first place? Yeah, so for the customer, I think you need to start with the clear milestones, how many customers you want to acquire at the beginning. So a lot of people come with an idea, assume, they're going to explode and we're going to have 1 million customer in, in two, three months. The reality, you need to go through uh, milestones. So our focus was let's get the first 100 customer, capture the learnings, understand what is the biggest pain point, what are we delivering good, are the value proposition very clear. So we start sending it to friends, families, and capture enough learning from 20 to 50 people, then if they like it, we ask him to refer it to their friends, to, to their family. So we had 100, 150 customer appraising the product, giving us a clear review, what they like, what they don't like. So we continue iterating until we felt more confident about the product, the reliability. Then we start going digital. And in that digital, we already capture the attribution uh, information meaning the age uh, of the people who liked are actually early prototype and that's helped us in targeting on digital and we continue growing our customer and you should have a clear channels a clear funnel on getting the customer either digitally or offline and you continue just growing your customer base so we start from the 100 then to 1000 customer 10,000 and we continue that uh, momentum so at the end of the day, it's going to come to the basics and understanding who's your customer, what's their problem, and how can you create the added value ongoing. And they say the biggest uh, source of growth is retention. So you need to make sure your customer are coming back, they are happy, and uh, that's what they call moat. So moat is something that you stop your competition from uh, creating the switching cost and your customer going to your competitors. So you need to make sure that the customer is not just coming, but also coming back and you create that stickiness going forward. So before you spend hundreds of thousands with influencer or advertisement, you need to make sure your first 100 customer actually likes your product, like your service. Then you can go step by step 
And with that obsession and understanding, you can build a customer base that uh, loyal to your service and products. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Nasser, he is uh, a colleague of ours. He'd like to ask a question. Yes, Dr. Nasser. You may unmute your mic and uh, ask the question. I think he is, uh, Dr. Nasser, are you right? Okay, so while he's coming back uh, to us, uh, regarding now Sari itself, uh, the B2B uh, scene in Saudi Arabia, how do you think that is evolving in the next couple of years in the B2B sector itself? So in Saudi, there are around uh, a million SMEs. 88% uh, of those SMEs are micro businesses. And micro business by definition is one to five employee with annual revenue of uh, 3 million real. So there is a huge segment that does not have the infrastructure, uh, wants to break from the micro to small to, to, to medium uh, segment. So there are a lot of opportunity on the, on the infrastructure uh, landscape. And as I mentioned, a lot of them are looking for a financial support, either as microfinancing or as a solution like SARI to minimize the cost for them so they become more efficient. So for us, our focus is to make sure all these small businesses are efficient so they can have enough profitability component. They can grow actually beyond one store uh, location. They could go, glow, could, could go nationally. So our focus is to make sure that they have the efficiency uh, component. And I think going forward, the government want to increase uh, the SME's uh, contribution uh, to, the, to the GDP from 20% to 35%. So a lot of uh, stimulus, a lot of subsidy going to come from the government to help SME's become uh, surviving COVID-19 and after. So a lot of pack of businesses is going to come making sure those startup or making sure these businesses are efficient. And another one, another uh, segment is gonna be a lot of businesses helping those businesses uh, have more cash in hand. So that's the B2B transaction. And for Sari is gonna, gonna be e-commerce. Now we're going to financing, going forward even, we're gonna give you microservices. So you no longer have an accountant, you can just, activate one of our services and you already have taxation filing and zakah and everything to make your job just easier and with lower uh, workforce and cost of uh, employee burden wonderful uh one other question relating to the b2b uh do you see b2b international b2b solutions coming in as competition now So the market for B2B globally is $9 trillion and uh, there are players, so Amazon already launched in, the, uh, in Saudi but just purely to B2C. There are other players in, I think in India and China. So yeah, there are a lot of players but there are so many sectors in B2B. Uh, some of them is a cross border which is B2B bazaar that makes sure that product coming from China or India or uh, other emerging markets. But uh, Sari is focusing on local goods and local services and on-demand distribution that happens under three hours. So yes, there will be uh, a lot of international player coming to, to, to the landscape, probably from China. Amazon could expand to businesses. And that's good opportunity to, to increase the awareness of that uh, industry. Today, retail market just in Saudi is around $118 billion. Uh, and when you go to the food retail, it's around $65 billion. When you go to Bakala and traditional trade, it's around 4 to $5 billion. So it's a huge market. It can take multiple players. And one of the learning that I got when, when I worked with Karim is 
most of businesses does not operate in zero sum market so it can take multiple players and you need to focus on bringing what's your va unique value proposition to survive uh, competition and build defensibility around your customer so i think we're already now at a five percent market share from the offline we are continuing the growth and that's what one of the reason why you fundraise to go in a higher velocity to continue capturing more market share to make it harder for competitor to enter great in fact that is one question that the students were asking in my last class of why they should actually go into a market where there are uh, apps or products already available and uh, you've you've summed that up perfectly so thank you for that uh, dr nasser is here with us he would like to ask a question dr nasser yes assalamu alaikum uh, thank you muhammad uh, for uh, for coming first and for this uh, fruitful discussion and uh, insightful conversation actually um, I found most uh, most of the things you have mentioned are like uh, in the challenges, for example, are actually faced by our students and entrepreneurs from our circles. Like when you mentioned about uh, choosing the team and uh, one particular challenge that is, I think, because most of our students are uh, business school students. So, um, having technology startups and creating apps uh, without you know uh, having the tech edge so if they don't have the uh, you know the right partners uh, uh, from you know developers or uh, programmers so um, uh, i just want to hear your thoughts about whether actually starting uh, a company or creating a startup that is actually uh, tech uh, oriented without having you know uh, in-house uh, programmer as as they just start is it feasible uh, because there is some discussion and conversation in the industry and in the actually also uh, in the academic uh, fields about whether uh, actually startups can actually uh, initiate successful startups at the beginning at least for the first stage with the MVV uh, by hiring external consultants or external uh, developers to help them these business students to create their own startups so uh, what are your thoughts i know we know that at the end they need to have in-house developers but at the mbv stage at least yeah very clear it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for that very very critical question um, so I, I was a business student once and a lot of people get actually wrapped in the idea of equity on paper we're all billionaire and on, on, on paper saying i want 60 percent you want 70 i have the idea i'm going to take 80 percent this is all meaningless if you don't build a real organization and a product so equity aside you need to look for a technical partner and I think KFUPM has the best talent, I think, in, the, in Saudi and probably in the region. So you've been producing a lot of leader in tech and businesses. And so uh, I think connecting the dots, seeing uh, people that actually in Wa'id, people on, on Dahran Valley, uh, as a technical founders, uh, I think there is a lot of list of people came uh, and graduated from KFUPM that are qualified technically. Actually, my co-founder is KFUPM. Uh, the director of operation we have is also KFUPM. -er. So there are a huge talent pool in KFUPM. And I think you can activate that on the alumni uh, network that if there are any technical people are attracted to come in in the program and start contributing uh, in, the, in the technology aspect or the technical side so mvp does not necessarily need to be a functional product uh, it could be actually uh, a prototype to be tested uh, it could be built on white label product that's available there are a lot of solution today is no code uh, actually infrastructure 
So you could build a lot of things today, even if you are not technical, to build the MVP. I've seen a lot of people even build MVP using uh, PowerPoint with hyperlinks and everything. An MVP does not need to generate revenue. It just needs to validate a proof of concept. So at the end of the day, uh, you could do that or bring uh, a technical partner in a contract base. Going to agency or consultation that's not in Saudi or maybe in Saudi, it will bring a huge cost. Uh, most of service provider, they have a huge pipeline of clients. If you are not one of their strategic client, you will not be a priority. So you will go through a number of cycles. They might be become a bottleneck for you. And if you don't hold your destiny, it will become a challenging. For an MVP level, again, I think a lot of the students here are capable to build something that at least functional for testing. Uh, you could actually hire someone from uh, Upwork or if you want to go to more, something more sophisticated, there is a network called TopTal. You could get them for, uh, for a project base just to show the modeling or the, the project. And again, I would recommend actually the Almanai network, people coming and doing extracurricular as uh, helping the business student just to build a proof of concept and if it succeeds it could be actually a big business for them outside so that's one of the component university can work with is connecting their student from technical and uh, business side but i'm all against uh, building anything outside because you don't have the product roadmap within your hand and if you are forced to do it just do it uh, so a lot of mvp actually we we had the chance to go to the silicon valley meet a lot of startup some of them raised by having a mock-up just on a paper and interacting with people capturing their uh, feedback so as much as you have feedback you have good understanding of the market you have good numbers that's good enough uh, to 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 trigger uh, the investment from your side so, so I would recommend looking always for a technical partner or do the MVP yourself. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Shabab, now there is no excuse. If you, wanna, if you don't have a technical partner, you can do your MVP without one. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Taha. Thank you, Dr. Nasser. Uh, we'll take any more last question from uh, the students, any last question before we end the session? Maybe students are a little bit, uh, I think they've got a lot of motivation. Any last motivating words you'd like to give uh, Muhammad? And, and how can Sari help uh, the students now? A lot of our students are now going to be uh, graduating in one year. Uh, within that time, we have two summer sessions. Uh, how can you and Sari also uh, help uh, the students in terms of uh, uh, their startups uh, and uh, any other motivating words that you can give. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a pleasure to be again here talking to you. Um, I think you need to, to have the mindset that uh, anything that you're going to do is just uh, has many probabilities going to fail. And actually, you need to make things fail fast rather than wait a couple of years and learn that's not working. And that's the idea of the MVP and uh, the proof of concept that you're going to have. You make sure that you capture the learning. Uh, a lot of people assume when you go to investor or go to the committee, you need to be building a perfect product. In reality, you have to show that you understand the weakness, the vulnerabilities, the issue that you need to fix. And uh, that's the, 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 let's say, the essence of this, of this year, of this course, is uh, to understand how to know your uh, assets, what's the, the things that to be fixed, how to build your hypothesis, how to iterate fast. And uh, that will help you actually to build sustainable business. You, will, you should be the one that criticizing your business 
Otherwise, other startup or other company will compete and try to get you out of business. So try to get the best out of this course by actually challenging yourself because that's the best learnings you will get. If you have the chance actually to work with other startup in this period or in the summer, go ahead and try because that's the best experience you'll try to, to, to get equipping you to, to start your business in the future. We would love to welcome you in Sari. Uh, after COVID-19, you can visit our office. We could show you what we do day to day, experience uh, the kitchen of, uh, of a startups on hyper growth. But uh, again, at the end of the day, try to, to build a business that has a huge market, has a clear timing, and that you can build uh, and cultivate a good team around. And again, enjoy the journey, enjoy the experience of doing this, and assume that everything, most of startups are actually destined to fail, but try to minimize the liability, minimize the chances of failure by uh, addressing the issue, by addressing the weakness and adjusting. Thank you very much. I think those were very uh, good insights and very highly motivating words for our students. Uh, I'll, take, I'll take this opportunity to thank you, Mohammed and Sari for joining us today. It was a very insightful session. I think uh, we all learned a lot and uh, hopefully would love to have you back again sometime in the future uh, with a different topic, with uh, more insights from you. And uh, we will definitely be honored after this COVID-19 situation to visit Sari and uh, see what's uh, cooking there, as he said. But thank you very much for coming today. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, thank you all the students for attending today. For the students, please don't uh, forget to mention your names, your IDs, and uh, your professors in the chat box. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, and uh, have a nice day, inshallah. We'll keep in touch. Uh, thanks all for everyone for joining. Uh, have a good day. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.